All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you president of the Hartford Foundation, Mr. Jay Williams. <laughs> Thank you once again, Stephanie, for the introduction. Good evening. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'm Jay Williams. I have the privilege and the opportunity of serving as the president of the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving and want to welcome all of you here this evening for what is the 11th stop on our, maybe not quite a whirlwind tour, but a greater Hartford wind tour of each of our 29 communities. Uh, tonight focusing, we're in infield, but we'll be uh, having stakeholder conversations and, and really listening uh, to all of you as stakeholders of both Enfield and Summers. Uh, and I can tell you there is a, uh, a special connection that I have here because it was about two, two and a half years ago. I was here in this very building uh, in my previous capacity as Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Economic Development uh, with the Obama administration. We had come to uh, Enfield uh, because of uh, a program that as Nuntuck Community College uh, operates, uh, which was providing uh, relevant high man manufacturing, advanced manufacturing workforce skills to students uh, and I got to take a tour of the facility and a tour of other parts of the campus having no idea, absolutely zero idea uh, that I would ultimately become a resident uh, of this region and be back here uh, as, as Nuntuck uh, as in my capacity with the Hartford Foundation. So it is exciting to be out here. Uh, we are going to uh, engage in a conversation. We are so excited about the uh, feedback that we've gotten from uh, all of the communities uh, that we've engaged. Uh, this is for us to do less talking and, and really more listening, to hear from you. Uh, so before uh, we get to that point, I want to show a very brief video to set the context and then we'll go from there. One of the lines in the video uh, described us accurately as uh, one of the largest community foundations in the entire country. We are the largest community foundation uh, in this state. And this is your community, and it's our community too. We are your community foundation. Uh, and we are engaged uh, in a series of discussions uh, with all of our stakeholders to uh, ask a, a couple of simple questions that uh, you all are gonna give us very valuable answers to and very valuable feedback. And that's how we can be a more valuable and impactful partner. We've been around for 93 years. Uh, we've been fortunate uh, and, and blessed with the generosity of uh, thousands of individuals and families uh, and organizations from across the 29 community region who have entrusted us with uh, their resources, their well-earned, precious resources, uh, to allow us to be a steward of those resources, to put uh, those resources back into the community uh, through the work of our nonprofit partners, uh, of which we could not do any of the things that we do because we're not a direct service provider. Those nonprofit partners are. And without those individuals who have philanthropic interest and are generous and have a trust in us, uh, you know, none of this would be possible. So although we've been around for 90 uh, plus years, and although we uh, have learned a lot and experienced a lot, we recognize that we can't take for granted. Uh, the old adage, if you do the same thing the same way and expect different results, you know, that's, that's, that's insanity. And the landscape has changed dramatically. I am new to Connecticut. My family and I are new to the greater Hartford region, but we're not new to the experience. Uh, growing up in Youngstown, Ohio, the Mahoning Valley, Youngstown and Hartford have some uncanny similarities. So I understand communities that are going through a transition, that have been challenged by a global and national economic forces, challenged to uh, really retain a quality of life because there are great people and great assets here and great opportunities. Uh, but the challenges are very real, the problems are real. At the state level, uh, at the municipal level, uh, you know, Hartford's issues reverberate throughout the community and vice versa. But the thing that gives, uh, should give all of us hope is that the uh, aspirations, the persistence uh, that is a, a part of the DNA here uh, is something that makes none of these challenges insurmountable. Uh, and the fact that we have a partnership and there is uh, the fact that the foundation exists here as a direct result of the philanthropic generosity uh, for the purpose of uh, affecting change and being impactful uh, is why we're excited. So uh, we want to hear from you. How can we be more valuable? How can we be more impactful? What are the things uh, that you love about your community, about Summers and Enfield? Uh, what are the aspirations you have for your community? What are some of the things that concern you or frustrate you? So we've gotten a lot of positive feedback and we've also gotten feedback and people have shared with us where we've come short. 
So, you know, we're not here for you to pat us on the back and, and, and just uh, say, you know, that everything is lovely. We are here to take this information, this feedback. We are using it to help inform our, our strategic plan that we're putting together uh, as we speak. And we had a, a meeting with our board yesterday to get some additional guidance and have a discussion with them. And we made it very clear to the board, uh, with their full support, that the discussions we're having with the community are invaluable to help shape the direction of our work uh, over the next uh, number of years. So uh, that's about all I have to say in the beginning because again, this is about us hearing from you. There are a number of staff members here in addition to you know, Stephanie who brought you know, probably, you know, a, 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 I don't know how many family, we got a table full of family members here and probably others on the way. So we appreciate that. Uh, a number of the vice presidents and other staff members. If the Hartford staff would just sort of you know, make yourself known. So I'm up here, uh, but believe me, this doesn't get done without a talented staff who are more intelligent and, and passionate uh, you know, uh, collectively than any of us can do individually. So we want to hear from you. And as I say at every one of these, this doesn't work uh, if I or the staff are doing all the talking. So. Um, uh, you know, the questions, the comments, the observations are, are what we're here for. Uh, and and I, as I say that this is a group that uh, if we don't get started and, and nobody breaks the ice, I take direct eye contact as a sign that you want to say something. So either don't look directly at me or just raise your hand. I mean, e either way, we're going to get some, some discussion going. Uh, so I, thank you. Right out the gate. So um, first off, I want to thank you for being here and making this opportunity to speak to you uh, available. Uh, my name is Joshua Hamry and I am a resident of Enfield for 18 years or so. Um, I've got children in the school system. Uh, I've got uh, ERFC providing for one of my children. Um, PLA is represented here, Parent Leadership Academy. My wife and I have gone through that program. Um, I'm a relative to the Maloney family over here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew it, I knew it. <laughs> I'm not kidding about that either. Uh, <laughs> We have our reunion coming up this Saturday. Um, so um, in my professional work, I'm a case manager for homeless vets uh, for a nonprofit in Hartford. In my spare time, I'm on the board of directors for the uh, Pioneer Valley USO of Massachusetts. I'm also on the uh, board of directors for a local community theater, the Opera House Players. And uh, to that, that's the point that, that I want to talk about tonight. Um, we are in the process of moving from Broadbrook to um, High Street here in Enfield. We've got a lot of stuff going on. You know, there's a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of work to do. And we are diligently uh, and um, efficiently getting the work done. My concern that I wanted to just ask uh, for your thoughts uh, and, and possible actions are, and we are moving to uh, 100 High Street in Thompsonville. Thompsonville is not the, uh, um, the, it doesn't have the best reputation. It doesn't necessarily deserve the level of negative attention it gets, but uh, to that point, I've been in town for a very long time. I've been listening to town council and board of ed meetings for years. And I've spoken up about some concerns and where investments should be made to make the communities more solid, to build this community and uh, the neighborhood familiarity and so on. So as things have worked out over the years, being on the board, moving to Thompsonville, we have the first tangible, real, hands-on progress towards positive development in Thompsonville that I can identify in a very long time. Okay. Um, through the years of hearing meetings and uh, talking heads e explain why things haven't been moving forward, I would just ask if there's anything else that could be done for the community. And I, I don't want to mention through PLA, we volunteered with uh, the soup kitchen with um, Lowe's and Fishes. I'm not sure if anybody here is Lowe's and Fishes, but Lowe's and Fishes is less than a couple of blocks away from our new home in Enfield. Um, we, um, we have an opportunity to be the catalyst for a lot of positive growth in Enfield. Uh, the train station discussion in town is, um, for whatever reason, a, a, a point of contention for some, but it's also a point of positive growth that would help us improve the, the town overall and improve the neighborhood 
that we were living in. Uh, and I live in Thomasonville too, so I've, I've got a vested interest in most everything that uh, happens in town. Um, so without taking too much of your time, I just wanted to thank you again for having this opportunity to speak directly to you. And if there's any way that um, the foundation could consider uh, looking into ways that we can improve, including the old Strand building. I know the Strand Theater is a, a, a non-issue, a non-starter, uh, at least in town, and then, you know, and then it starts up and then it dies off again. So there's a lot of, <laughs> somebody knows, <laughs> there's a lot of different ways that the uh, town can be improved upon. Uh, and not to say that they haven't made any efforts, but um, the input and the uh, influence would be sure. tremendous. Well, thank you. We would welcome that conversation. And as it would uh, happen, we have been involved uh, in, in community and economic development uh, throughout the um, uh, you know, last number of years. But we are making a, a much more pronounced uh, commitment to community and economic development. Uh, as a part of our strategic plan, as a part of our activity, and as a part of our investment areas. So to that end, uh, you know, we would welcome a conversation uh, with you and others uh, about the progress that you're talking about that is after you know, frustration and fits and starts, and, and that's not uncommon uh, when you talk about communities you know, wanting to, to develop, uh, about you know, the vision and a plan behind that, about some of the other stakeholders that might be involved and how we uh, might be, you used the word catalyst, uh, and that is a word that we've been uh, using more frequently as it relates to uh, our desire and our commitment to get involved in economic and community development, is how can we utilize our resources uh, to be a catalyst to attract other uh, development. We can't do it uh, with uh, our resources alone. The city or the town can't do it with its resources. Uh, the private sector, you know, comes in, but, but there needs to be, you know, conditions. And so when you bring all of those different stakeholders together in a conversation, uh, it is much more likely to be able to result in something that might uh, get legs and get some traction. So, you know, we would welcome that. And, uh, you know, we've seen success uh, in our region. I can tell you that my background is, uh, you know, in community and economic development. So I've, uh, you know, seen successes in other parts of the country. Uh, we would love to share that knowledge if there are other similarly situated communities that we can bring together some of that knowledge. So uh, by all means, if you would, would, would reach out to us and, and we can begin a conversation around that and see who some of the other interested parties are. Um, because it doesn't you know, always take a lot. So it takes that start and that, that success builds other success. So yeah, we'd welcome that conversation. Thank you. Sure. Hi, my name is John Laley. I'm the executive director of a nonprofit called Today I Matter. Okay. What we do is we work to reduce the shame and stigma of mental illness and addiction by really promoting positive um, growth in the community and education um, in, in emotional and in physical health. Mm -hmm. And um, certainly this is a problem that's not unique to this, this town or this state, or, um, but we worry about the addiction problem, as everyone does these days. But there is a, it's a, it's, I think it's uniquely a little bit worse in this town than some other towns. Um, Enfield alone has lost 14 individuals in just the last year, wow. and another five in summers, which is quite a high number. That's more, that's more debts for young people than through any other single cause. And so we need to do something about that. And one of the problems that we find um, that's echoed by some national leaders, a barrier, is, is shame and stigma. And there's a lot of misunderstanding about these problems. There's not really, I think there's a, there's a lack of education about these issues, about medical um, explanations of these issues to help people understand. So it's easy for people to blame. And it pushes people that have these struggles, either individuals and or their families, underground so they can't get the support, they don't get the help that they need or the treatment because of the stigma and embarrassment and prejudice against them. So we're really interested in how, how you might help us um, just to, to promote some programs that promote um, education basically and which is hard because we're really looking for an attitude shift right and that's nothing that can be done legislatively it's got to be done from the ground up so there are a lot of grassroots groups like ours around we're not we're not alone in doing this um, that that travel around and and trying to change people's attitudes we put out we have a, a memorial poster project we have 80 posters of 
individuals that have passed from addiction, including our own son. Right. Um, and we put these out right. there, so we are proud of these people. These are all good people from good families, from good communities. Try to help break down the, the typical idea that we used to have in our mind when we think of a drug addict right. is not the picture that we're seeing uh, anymore. So we really think we're looking for help and ways to do that in a mass way through right. through advertising, through billboards, through just really getting the pictures out there to say this is this is us, sure. this is all of us, this is our community, this is our own people and our children. Sure. So I'm wondering how it might be helpful in that way. Well, thank you for the work that you do uh, in that area. And you talked about two uh, distinct challenges, both mental illness and, and, and the uh, addictions and the stigmas that come with that. Probably uh, five, maybe six weeks ago, uh, if it was that long, uh, we hosted at the foundation a summit uh, that we brought in uh, a couple of individuals who were speaking on uh, the opioid crisis and the addiction and how, to your point, it has begun ravaging uh, so many of our communities. And it isn't, uh, as you've articulated, uh, you know, when you think of an, an addict, you know, there's that stereotypical, uh, or it used to be, you know, hopefully it's, 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 it's um, evolving, but that, that, that old stereotypical, you know, somebody who just was a, a, a undesirable or somebody who was just different or sort of brought this on themselves, uh, as opposed to, you know, people who uh, are your neighbors or the person you see at church or the person you see at the grocery store, or the person who is, you know, the, the uncle of the, of, the, of the child that your, you know, child plays with. Um, and it was interesting to hear, uh, and, and like you said, this isn't unique to uh, Enfield or Summers, but it is uh, no less impactful, as you pointed out, 14 people in, uh, in, in, in Enfield and five in Summers just in the last year. Uh, these aren't big communities, so I would venture to say that, you know, someone, uh, a lot of people in this room probably knew the person or knew a person who was related to the person. So in hosting that, we've had a number of our donors who have expressed uh, an interest in how they could help. So, you know, bringing in, and that's just one example, is bringing in uh, individuals who have expertise in those areas, uh, engaging donors who want to utilize their resources, uh, through their donor advised funds, in addition to uh, helping to educate us as a foundation as to where we might leverage some of our resources. So there's, you know, the financial aspect that, that may be of benefit. There's the ability to convene expertise in conversations. There's the ability to bring other similarly situated communities or other organizations that do similar work to talk about some of the success or challenge, successes or challenges that might be able to be replicated. So again, we, we welcome that conversation. and. Uh, as we hear these things here, you're going to hear me repeat that time and time again, because clearly we're in the, you know, a less than an hour we have in this discussion, we're not going to solve those things. But one of the things we want to make very clear is that the approaches, uh, you know, start with engaging us and having a conversation so we can learn more about the issues and, and how we might be uh, of assistance. So, you know, to that end, would have loved to have had you at that summit that we had, you know, uh, five or six weeks ago, uh, but nevertheless, with the issue being as prominent as it is, I seriously doubt that will be the last summit that we have around that. Yeah, and even then, worse still. absolutely, exactly. So, you know, w w welcome that conversation. Thank you for the work. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good evening. Um, I want to also salute you for um, opening your, your ideas toward building partnerships because everyone benefits you all partner and as I do we yeah very interested in partnering with you who just spoke um i'm with a relatively new organization i'm trying to get off the ground i'm calling it partner partnering to reach aspirations and i've been very concerned about the lack of opportunities for our young adults um, on the autism spectrum as they're transitioning to help them transition from student life to independent living and gainful, meaningful employment. Um, there is very little out there, especially in this region, and um, the numbers that are coming up through the ranks are alarming. Um, only about 85, only, well, about 85% of this population ever has, has found employment in the last decade of any kind, and many of them are very underemployed. Um, so, I'm looking to create a community here in this region. Um, it's going to take a lot of partnerships, but to help transition over three to four years, um, it'll be a residential community. Um, it'll be hopefully as affordable as possible, 
for our, our residents. It's gonna be an integrated community, so we'll have um, young <coughs> professionals, veterans, um, s seniors living with this population um, as a community so that we have some good role models and mentors in the community. Um, everyone's gonna be involved with the upkeep of the community, the maintaining the community, but as we uh, get to know our residents and build on their interests and their skill base. Um, there's such a need. Um, it's going to take a societal shift to engage this population, but they have a lot of gifts that society would, would gain from, and um, businesses just have to realize there is a way to work with this population, but they're going to need to flex some and listen and um, hopefully over the next five to 10 years, because we have just within a 50 mile radius of where we are right this minute, um, there are gonna be 11,000 young people transitioning over the next decade from student life to independent living. And if we don't get them to that point, they're gonna be in our homes, they're gonna be homeless, their, their parents are very burnt out by this point, um, they often don't have a lot of um, economic resources to lean back on, and there is nothing available from them, for them right now f in the way of financial support from the state or the or, or national government. So it's gonna have to be a grassroots effort, and it's gonna take partnerships, but I think it really can be done because so many people are impacted by this. All right. How, you said this is a new nonprofit that you're getting off the ground. How long yes. have you been at this? Well, I wasn't a PL, <laughs> PTL parent teacher leadership training class a few years ago also. And <clears throat> had already thought about this project for a long time and said, all right, this is what I'm going to focus on for, during this class. And it's just I've kept it going and okay. I've just in, educated myself okay. about what's going on around the world, what's going on locally, what's going on with our, with our legislatures and government. Um, planting a lot of seeds, and um, so I'm just getting to a point where, you know, I want to form a board, okay. and I have a property in mind, which okay. um, some people gasp when I <laughs> mention it, but it's um, what was a, the St. Alphonsus Seminary just across the river here. It was the Culinary Inst Institute uh, most recently. It's been sitting there empty for seven years. Um, it has tremendous resources on, within one campus of 56 acres. Um, and it's next, top to Hill, it's next door to Hilltop Farm, which is um, a community-supported uh, farm that could easily be returned to a working farm and I think would be a great partnership to have. Um, and as Windsor Locks is rebuilding their center, and you're talking about tr a possible train stop here, um, we, you know, it, we could easily create um, some public transportation from from this point also. So, which would be important. So, anyway, that's what I'm Thank about. You. If anybody's interested in my card or or continuing a conversation, <laughs> I'd love to meet you afterwards. Thank you. <laughs> Somebody had a question. aspirations aspirations obviously being like we all as people have aspirations from a young at a young age and are autistic do too and um, I'm hoping that this is going to be a way for them to reach some of their aspirations and of course um, the population I'm really focusing on is our, our Asperg our as those with Asperger's so that's what the aspirations also comes in in the way of a name. So. so let me offer you this. Uh, if you're not aware, uh, please reach out to us. We have what's called a nonprofit support program. Uh, and the nonprofit support program offers a variety of tools and resources at, at no cost to nonprofits. Uh, you said that you were in the process of, of giving thought to forming a board. I mean, that's mm -hmm. one of the uh, resources in terms of uh, connecting you either with consultants or with our internal staff who has a uh, you know, a, a good bit of knowledge uh, in terms of helping nonprofits get off to a good start. And that's important that be because you've got a challenge in that field in and of itself. Uh, and to be able to get off to a strong start in giving the uh, thought and, and, and guidance about board formation and fund development and partnerships. 
So uh, if you're not aware of our NSP program, by all means, if you'd reach out to us and we'd love to okay. connect you with the NSP staff and just all sorts of things that you may or may not have thought of. And uh, the great thing about it, they've worked with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of nonprofits yeah. over the years. Uh, so That's there experience. is probably nothing they haven't seen <laughs> in terms of be aware of this or you know, maybe you're struggling here and we've got a whole host of resources or ability to connect you. So please reach out to our NSP pro program. Terrific, thank you so much. Absolutely, thank you. And, and a good example of just that, you talking about something and uh, you know, the ability to form partnerships here uh, in the community uh, that you may not be aware of. Yes. My, my inclination was to say Stephanie. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I just keep, right. Hi, I'm Heather Maloney, Stephanie's sister. <laughs> I've been a resident of Enfield for about 19 years. Uh, we moved here when we were 15. Um, one of the main concerns that I have is for the youth of the community. Um, they just built a new high school and consolidated everybody to one, which is great. But JFK um, Middle School is currently falling apart. It is not up to code. It has a lot of problems, overcrowding of classrooms. There's too many children to fit into the building. And there's also, they've also recently cut funding to the youth center which is located in thompsonville and in some some uh some ways those are that's the only safe place that children have to go to and they have cut snacks they've cut you know um it's not in <clears throat> the greatest shape either and i feel it's a really a disservice to the youth of the community while i don't have children one day i might and i want them to be able to have the Opportunities that other towns have. Um, <laughs> yes, we have a we have a building called Fermi High School that was our our alma mater that is now sitting empty, and they had just redone the done the fields to it, be prior to consolidating all of the high schools, which is unfortunate. So they've got this really great building with really nice fields that are brand new, sitting empty. And I was just wondering if there's anything you guys can do to help us with this problem. So with respect to you know, school facilities, that, that is uh, an area where our resources are, are uh, allocated. Uh, well, we do work with public entities, whether they are towns or municipalities or school districts. Uh, what we don't, and I know you're not suggesting this, but just so what we don't do, our you know, fund and resources uh, you know, aren't uh, and shouldn't be used to address or supplant the obligations of, of public, you know, dollars and public decision makers. That being said, though, uh, when you talked about the youth center and some of the programming uh, uh, that's been cut and, uh, and perhaps the condition of the youth center, so in that regard, that would be a conversation, is a conversation uh, that we'd welcome as to, uh, you know, what are some of the ways that, uh, you know, we might be able to uh, support or provide some assistance with respect to the programming. Uh, if it is a building that is owned by a nonprofit, you know, are there uh, plans for you know a capital campaign to to help improve some of the uh, facilities that again aren't uh, public facilities but are facilities that are uh, in control or owned by a nonprofit. So yeah, to that extent, uh, you know, those conversations are conversations, and those are uh, programs that we have and do support uh, in our 29 community region. So to the extent that, and what I love here is that, um, you know, we also want to promote, when appropriate, collaboration amongst and between communities. So, you know, the reality is there, you know, the, these are two distinct communities and we respect that and appreciate that. But at the same time, you know, with limited resources, where are things that we can focus on that provide, you know, the youth opportunities for both the youth of, of, of Enfield and Summers? Uh, no matter where that facility happens to be and, and, and make it something that it can be embraced by uh, both towns and, 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 and residents and young people from both. So we, yeah, we would absolutely welcome that and can talk about some of the uh, examples that we have engaged in and, and new ideas uh, that might come uh, and be appropriate. Thank you. Hi, my name's Karen LaPlante and I've been involved with a lot of different um, nonprofits, the Hazel Institute Conservancy that is trying to rehab a, a building in the center of Hazardville for many years um, and it's making progress 
the Four Town Fair, which does an agricultural fair uh, once a year, and they have a facility in summers. Um, and the Connecticut River Conservancy, we do the Source to Sea cleanup every year. I'm also on the Conservation Commission and the Agricultural Commission here in town. And one of the biggest issues I see with nonprofits is the ability to reach out to get volunteers. <laughs> and if there was some way, some large organization, like maybe you or one of your major donors, could create a database platform where you could put in your I'd, things that you would want to volunteer for. Maybe there could be people who would join the list and say, I want to do help with carpentry work uh, and help elderly people. And you know they would check off of certain things and then somehow this program would say, okay, well, he, these are our choices in your area. If you're willing to go a little further, you know, this would be the area. And I don't know if that exists, but I always thought it would be a great thing and uh, that might be something um, that would really help a lot of the groups here because I know it's not just the groups I deal with, but it seems to be a common occurrence. I mean, the, conservance, uh, the Connecticut River Conservancy, you know, when we do the source to sea cleanup, we rely on word of mouth and this person tells that person and come on, let's go down and have a fun day at the river and, and so forth, you know, we get our it out to the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts, but it's somewhat, um, it's not always great for kids because in certain areas you might be picking up needles and glass and things like that, which we try to, right. you know, not, you can't clean it completely right. sometimes. Right. Um, with the Four Town Fair, there's help needed with parking, there's help painting the buildings on the off season and, you know, all things like that. And there's a whole list I bet for every nonprofit of what they're looking for. Right. And if somehow that could be local and regional, um, that would be good. Um, I'm also on the Scanic River Watershed that does the uh, spring splash every year and they run a number of hikes and things in the area, Enfield Summers and East Windsor. So, um, and we're always looking for volunteers to run the race because it takes a lot of manpower to you know, keep the river safe you know, while everybody's paddling right. on those events, so. Um, but a, a database of some kind where people could access and actually the nonprofits could access, you know, and, and do some kind of, you know, back and forth. I, when you brought that up, I chuckled, and the staff probably did also, <laughs> uh, because I opened up saying, this is our 11th uh, tour stop. That sounds cool, a tour stop. This is our 11th tour stop. Uh, and, and probably a couple of them have been dual communities. So 11th tour stop, 15th or 16th of the communities. In every one of those 11 tour stops, this issue has come up without fail. Without fail. The universal frustration and desire to have, uh, you know, the, the, the volunteers that come, they're showing up, showing up, but you're wearing them out, burning them out, and they can only be in one place, and they can only do so much, uh, and there's so much to be done. And, uh, you know, having heard that in each of the tour stops, uh, the staff and I have talked about it and sort of wrestled with it. So, you know, I'm going to publicly challenge us as a foundation to, you know, do some research and figure out how we can uh, somehow convene uh, a, a, a discussion around this issue, you know, and, and find out is there, uh, you know, are there some experts somewhere in this country uh, that have really cracked the code of how to um, inspire or galvanize volunteers because, you know, the more volunteers you, you have, the, the, the less of a burden it is on, on any one individual. Uh, and to the extent that, uh, and I love your thought of having, you know, a database or something that is both regional but that allows you know, the towns to, it's a regional database, a Greater Hartford volunteer database, but at the same time, you know, from a practical standpoint, someone who is, you know, living in, uh, you know, Canton, you know, it's not practical to think that they might volunteer in infield or summers. So, but to be able to then zero in on uh, more local. So thank you for raising that. Uh, you know, the, the street continues of hearing that. But that being the case, I think you know, that's where you know, I'm going to say tonight that we're gonna challenge ourselves to 
uh, between now and uh, you know, we, 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 hopefully as we get toward the uh, end of this year, uh, and this is a, an exceptionally busy year for us, but one of the things that we are gonna do is at the end of the year on November 15th is our uh, annual event, our celebration of giving where we acknowledge our donors and our stakeholders uh, and, and everyone who has attended our one of our listening sessions is also gonna be invited. So we hope to see you there and you'll get a, an official invitation. But one of the things in it we'd like to do is in addition to talking about what we've heard and how that's informing our strategic plan, I would love uh, to be able to uh, announce something around this notion of how we're going to, in the new year, uh, convene a, a summit or a discussion a around volunteers. I, I mean, I would just, we would love nothing better than to do that. And so we're gonna put that challenge on ourselves to see if uh, as a part of that event, we can do something tangible uh, to, to bring together uh, all of the 29 communities with some expertise or something around how to begin cracking that code. And believe me, if it's not figured out and we figure it out here, it is going to be you know, a national uh, model that communities across this country are gonna uh, wanna replicate. And if someone else has done it, uh, you know, we'll, we'll still borrow by whatever we need to do uh, to get that kind of knowledge here. Thank you. Yes, you got the answer. Well, and on that note, um, and Lisa Rogers, again, volunteer is a huge issue. Um, could there be a definite campaign for whatever that platform is for what, and to have it, I, I wanna say statewide, that like just to, the advertising aspect of it, that here it is, you join it, your nonprofit joins it, but make that just as valuable and, and as much money and put into that. It has to be big, yeah, you know, it has to be big, it has to be something that, it's there. right, and, and I think that, and, and, and again, I'm, this is just sort of off the top of my head, that, that something that uh, perhaps starts in the greater Hartford region, if we get this right, that by definition, you know, this is a small state, so the folks down in you know, southern Connecticut and, and, and all across the state, you know, I, I haven't spent a lot of time down there, but I'm assured that if we talk to some of their nonprofits, the same issue exists. So you know, perhaps we start it here and it expands, and becomes a state model, and then it becomes a, a model you know, in, in New England. So that's, you know, I really, we're, we're gonna challenge ourselves to see if we can uh, you know, find something of substance that we can then announce at the end of the year and then say, come, you know, 19, we're gonna have this, this, this summit around that issue. Uh, and I would love nothing better for, uh, you know, the model to have started right here uh, in Greater Hartford. I saw another hand, I thought. Yes. Good evening, welcome. We welcome you to Znantuk. I'm Keith Medor. I'm the Director of Advancement here at Znantuk Community College, and we've had a couple projects with the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, and it's been renowning successful for us. Um, but we also carry the weight and the burden of being the only higher education institution that's affordable for you know thousands and thousands of individuals. And we have to recognize the barriers that they all have, which is often tuition and transportation and childcare. And we recognize that a lot of these people that are, whether they're coming from the Thompsonville area, whether they're coming from East Hartford, whether they're coming from Windsor Locks, or even Summers, um, we have an obligation to not only creating retention and graduates out there with, with, with work skills and opportunity, but leadership skills. And we, we look at um, the opportunity of more of an investment for us of just providing more than just a well-rounded graduate, but a, a good community citizen. And we've done that, I think, as Nantuck has been a pillar of the Enfield and Summers community of North Central for a very long time. You were here in January of 2016, I remember. Proud for us to have the Obama administration here and looking at our model of advanced manufacturing and everything we're doing. But it's not enough. It's never enough. We're looking at inner city kids um, that are being bused here that will no longer be bused here. They're being bused here to learn skills in manufacturing. And by then, when they're done, they'll have a job at $75,000, $65,000 a year. But the schools aren't paying for transportation anymore. Uh, those budget cuts that come across the way to the schools that the state financially is, is being hindered by trickles down to us as well. Um, we're looking at losing services for our students. Um, we run a co-op daycare, which is filled with 60 to 150 students a year. That's free, that's a unique model, one of two in the state. That may have to go away sometime. 
you tell that to the single mother or the single dad that drops off their kid during a class that has no other opportunity for education. We have an academic skill center that's completely supported by our inner foundation and donations from banks and so forth. You tell them that our retention rates are down because there's no longer dollars to support that anymore. And you look at transportation, and although we've made some headway out there, um, before the CT Pass um, initiative, which is paid by, by the system and student fees, uh, we were paying with a co-op with the town of Enfield bus transportation to get the students here. So we recognize the barriers. We know that they're there. We've made our efforts. We have leadership institutes for women at risk. We have a food pantry that stemmed from that. Uh, we are working with this, the colleges, uh, with um, our matriculation programs. So if a student leaves here at a Nuntuck, we have Elms College coming here and teaching their program at a Nuntuck rates. We've been as innovative as possible. And it's still a struggle. And I know, because I'm sort of in the same shoes where I'm out there knocking the pavement every day, looking for those support, those sponsors. Um, we've got 150 students coming here from different areas, learning the manufacturing program, because let's face it, in the next seven to 10 years, they're looking at 85,000 manufacturing positions at an average salary of $65,000 a year. If we can institute those skill sets continually, we can only afford to get 50 in here at a time. We have that large new facility out there. We've got 500 students enrolled in the program. That's great. But it's those youth that are at risk, that are fifth and sixth grade, seventh and eighth, ninth and tenth, that, that they don't believe they have a future. We can provide that future. We just need a partner. Thank you. And, and uh, when you talked about that notion, and that was a statistic that we cited often during the administration, this, this un fulfilled uh, demand for individuals who have skills that don't require uh, a PhD or an MBA or, or, or even a four-year degree, uh, that don't necessarily even require a two-year degree, that require a high school diploma and some skills, relevant, recognized industry skills uh, that places like as Nuntuck are absolutely providing. And, and I remember uh, when I did come here, there was a Young lady, uh, you know, she, she looked to be probably, I know she wasn't 12, but she might as well have been 12. You know, she just uh, was a, a, a tiny young woman who was, young lady who was working on one of the advanced manufacturing. And I, I don't recall either she was, you know, a senior in high school or had just transitioned out of high school. Uh, uh, and she, you know, I had a chance to talk to her. And, and this was a, uh, a program that typically was not a program that you, we see a lot of young ladies in. And she was just as adept, not that you expected otherwise, that she wouldn't be capable, but just to see her there uh, and, and the excitement uh, that she had about her career uh, opportunities. And your point that we have to capture these young people in fifth and sixth grade uh, and, and, and capture the imagination, hearts and mind, and the parents to let them know that these are careers to aspire to. These aren't default careers, sort of your, your safety, oh, I couldn't, you know, I didn't become a lawyer or doctor or I didn't go write code in Silicon Valley. So these are careers to aspire to uh, that coming out of the certification, to your point, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year uh, with upward potential, with benefits. Um, so to the extent of uh, how do we, and we've heard that here, that uh, places like, you know, you know, Electric Boat and Pratt and & Whitney are, are some of the large ones, but then a whole uh, host of smaller, uh, not as well known, uh, or, uh, companies and, and, and machine shops, you know, have a dearth. We, we've walked into a place, they said, you give us a list, you know, of people who have these basic skills. We'll put that last bit of proprietary information and training in them. But if they can walk on a floor and know what a CNC or, or PLC machine is, that's all we need. We will hire them on the spot and give them everything else that they need. So to the extent of uh, you identified some persistent barriers, and that's a term that we have been uh, you know, recognizing as we put together a strategic plan, again, uh, would welcome a conversation to figure out what are the partnerships uh, that might be able to produce some solutions to those barriers. Uh, you, know, you know, we may take, uh, all of us got here somehow, you know, and sometimes taking for granted the ability to hop into your car and get where you need to go or have reliable, consistent transportation. Uh, and this isn't an area, uh, Connecticut uh, is not an area that, that mass transit uh, is as prevalent uh, as, you know, I spent six years in D.C. where I, I didn't need and didn't want a car uh, and sold my car because the ability to 
uh, utilized mass transit, which then provided a benefit for people across the economic spectrum. Um, so because that's not what we have here and probably not for the foreseeable future, CT Fast Track is great. I've used it myself since I've been here. Uh, but how can we partner to figure out ways that are creative and innovative and cost effective so you know, that's not a barrier that keeps those uh, you know, working folks from getting the certification they need or the young people from getting the certificate. You're, 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 you're doing your part. You know, you're providing this industry recognized at an affordable price, uh, but to your point, that in and of itself is still not enough. It's getting them here on a regular basis. So you know, we'd welcome a conversation about what other partners exist uh, that we can perhaps put together an approach, work with you to put together or support an approach uh, that would t t try to provide and, you know, you 50 here and, 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 you know, how do you keep, how do you scale that? How do you scale that so it's, uh, you know, we don't lose those individuals to other communities or those manufacturers are saying, you know, they, they, we just can't fill it and we've got we've to go elsewhere. Thank you. Um, and co-founder of ours, Nuntuck Pantry, and founder of co-founder of our Women's Leadership Institute. So yes, we're doing our part. I just wanted to add to this conversation that, at the end of the day, our manufacturing students are not graduating with a hundred thousand dollars of debt. student debt right. that they cannot pay back, right. never own a home, etc. Right. I just wanted to add that in because that's, no, that's a huge. very important piece right. of the conversation. You're right. You're right. You're absolutely. And thank you for uh, bringing that up, which is why. Uh, you know, our community colleges and, and, and other institutions uh, are even that much more valuable. And again, that's taking nothing away from those individuals who, you know, pursue their, uh, uh, I you know, education and, and, and we need those individuals who continue to go to our Ivy Leagues and our four-year institutions. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we all know individuals who have gone through that and, you know, come out with significant you know, debt, even, and, and some of them come out significant debt and, you know, are making 30 or 40 or $50,000 a year. And even if you're making twice that, that's a lot to, to have to carry early on in your career. So again, that's why the partnerships and, and, and the, the niche that these institutions feel, uh, you know, it, it is a niche, it is a, it is a critical part of our, our economic uh, approach here, uh, not only in Connecticut, but President Obama made it very clear, which is why uh, under the leadership of uh, Secretary Pritzker uh, at Commerce Department uh, and Secretary uh, Tom Perez, former secretaries, uh, Commerce and Labor began working together to, you know, create those pathways for individuals. Uh, so thank you for adding that. So uh, what are some of the things uh, that you enjoy uh, that make these communities in Filton Summers the quality of life, the things that either uh, attracted you here, uh, that keep you here, uh, and on the flip side of that coin, some of the things that we haven't talked about that you know are of concern. Uh, you know, as as you you know think about the place that these communities have in the Greater Hartford region, and that's something that has been often talked about: is this is a region. Uh, and a region that is interconnected is impacted by things that go on. Uh, you know, Hartford is, uh, you know, a separate community. It's the capital city, but it doesn't exist in isolation. Uh, but so what are some of the things I'm, we're curious, uh, you know, that the quality of life that attracted you here, keeps you here, and, and on the flip side of that, some of the things that you sort of see on the horizon that might be of concern. Yes. Hi, Gretchen Pfeiffer Hall. So. I'm president of the Hazardville Institute Conservancy that Karen mentioned, and we've both worked on a number of projects together. So what drew me, well, I was born here, so I didn't really I have any choice, in, right? but, um, <laughs> but I stayed here. I'm the right. only person left um, in my family still living here. I come from a family of six children. And um, so number one, the people. Um, number two, I think geographically, it's, it's a great area. We have 91, um, which gives easy access for different places of employment, but mm -hmm. also for um, recreational activities. So mm -hmm. we're, we're close to, to the beach, we're close to skiing, close not that far from um, other sort of uh, cultural activities, Boston, Hartford. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping to go to the Jazz Festival this weekend in Very Hartford. Oh, maybe we'll see you there. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, so 
those are some of the things that, that I think are, are great in, in the Connecticut River Good. and in our Scantic River. So um, the other thing that I'm involved in is the Enfield Conservation Commission. So my interests are basically twofold, historic and our, our natural resources. Mm -hmm. So um, the Hazardville Institute Conservancy did reach out to your organization a number of years ago. So okay. we're always looking for funding because we're restoring a building that was built in 1869. Okay. Um, so we're, we're hoping to... That result in any, any engagement? The no. <laughs> so let's no. try again. Well, I, I would love to. So, because um, we, it's, it's a slow process. I mean, we've been working on this building for over 20 years, but okay. um, it's, it's slowly getting there. Okay. So, um, forgot where I was going with this. <laughs> Well, one of the issues you talked about was, you know, this, the region. Uh, and when you talked about, again, you know, you have the ability to live here, enjoy the amenities, and yes. so in 20 minutes. So right. um, and, and you mentioned it, and a couple of other people have sort of mentioned it. So we do have the Magic Carpet Bus, which is sort of a, a town-wide um, little bus that oh. goes around town. And I think that um, it's been a, a great help to us, Nantuck, I, I believe. And Does it serve uh, infield in summers? Is it? No, it's just no, Enfield. Just okay. It's just Enfield. It sort of does a couple of loops through through town. Okay. Um, so and of course the transit station, which uh, the town is has has a lot of high hopes for, because um, that seems to be. Would this be for the the the, the line? That so is that that would be for Amtrak. Okay. Hartford Springfield. Hartford Springfield. The, the line that's going yeah. now that would just. Uh, an extension well, of the Hartford line that I mean that's going up. To well, hoping to get a, a stop here. Okay, so got we, it. We, we're not, um, we don't have a stop yet. Okay. So right. uh, Windsor Locks does okay. in Springfield. Um, so the quality of life for, you know, I think that's important is, mm -hmm. is our, our natural resources. That's why people want to live near places that are healthy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the preservation of our, of our historic resources is very important. And it's also an economic driver, providing jobs. And um, so we're hoping that our building will not just be a museum, but will be a, a place of, of activity for the community to meet in. Good. So not just a place to look at things. Right. And, and I can tell you that uh, one of our more recent um, listening uh, tour stops was in Farmington. Uh, and they talked about that. In fact, it was in the Hillstead Museum, uh, and they uh, talked about the the natural resources uh, were one of the things that they embrace for the quality of life. Uh, in addition to being an economic driver, uh, and we have as a as a um, country and, and communities have evolved that it doesn't have to be one or the other. Uh, and and for a period of time, and again, I'm from Youngstown, Ohio. So Youngstown, Ohio became famous because of the steel mills that were built on the Mahoning River, uh, and that the, the river provided the water to cool and produce the steel, uh, and it was seen as an economic uh, asset or tool. Uh, so when they were done with the steel production, all of the you know contaminants and things, they oh we'll just put it back into the river because it was seen only as one dimension. So here we are, you know, a hundred years later, recognizing oh my God, you know what did we do? So communities that have recognized that you know, that often turn their backs to their bodies of water or saw that, you know, the, the natural resource of the wilderness as sort of just there, but not as a, an opportunity or an asset to draw uh, economic activity and to improve and enhance the quality of life. So to that end. Well, and that's a big conversation that we've had here about the Connecticut River and then Karen's involved with the Scantic River Watershed Association that hosts the, uh, the Spring Splash, mm -hmm. which is a canoe race, which brings in a lot of people. Yep. And that organization was very involved with getting the Springborn Dam removed, mm -hmm. which yep. um, had a lot of sediment from um, mills right. upriver in, in summers and, and also in, in Enfield that had a lot of uh, contamination. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I, I absolutely agree with you that um, the, the arts is, can also be a big part of um, historic preservation, just as the, the Opera House, which has taken over the 100 High Street building, um, and is, is an opportunity for um, 
programs for, for young people. So I think arts and, and music programs are, are really important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. We'll come. I'm sorry, I kept missing. I'll come to you next. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Hi. Hi. So my name's Laura Lally, and I'm with this same group called Today I Matter. You know this guy sitting next to you? I do. All right, all right. <laughs> So Saturday will be 30 months since we lost our oldest son to a heroin overdose. And one of the things, we live just in Ellington. Mm -hmm. So we both grew up in Enfield, but we raised our family in Ellington. And one of the things that I love about this area is the camaraderie that can happen among families and the things that you see when there's crisis and people come together. But living on this darker side right now, I see some of the other side and I see isolation, and I see um, blame. And you know, we, we were told of a family within the same town where a 16-year-old young man was struggling with a substance use, and across town was the same boy, in, a boy in his same class, right. struggling with a cancer. And at that boy's house, people stopped and mowed the lawn and dropped off casseroles and did all sorts of other things. But for the family with the young man with substance use, People didn't let their kids go over there and said this is a hard, you know, it's a bad family. They got drugs over there. You know, you're not allowed over there and things. And so, you know, I definitely see that those sort of two sides to the world. And one of the things, I mean, it's devastating to lose your child and to be out there with your face and your kid's face, you know, saying what happened. And you know, we do this because we don't want another. I don't want another mother to be where I am, which are many days where you can't pick your head off the pillow. You know, things like that. And so, you know, we work really hard to try to get rid of that, that shame and secrecy because then people don't get care and then people die. Um, we've had families that have come to us and said, "Thank you for speaking about this," because my family won't talk about this. Um, so we do a lot of just outreach, even to. To, un to educate um, first responders, to not think they're just going to another junkie's house, right. you know, things like that. Right. Um, but, and we have found in our outreach that there are people that are coming more and more around, right. you know, so there is hope in that, in that um, but we still have a long way to go. But, it, you know, it's just the dark side of where I live um, and that, but, you know, trying to raise that brighter side a little bit more. We're going to thank you both for being here and sharing that and, and can't even imagine, you know, 30 months and, and you're, you're here. Uh, you know, the fact that, as you talked about that camaraderie and that support and, and how valuable it is, but for you to, both of you, being willing to share that to your point so another mother doesn't have to find herself or another father has to find themselves mm -hmm. where, where you all do. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Aaron? Yeah. Hi, I'm Erin Nolan. I am Stephanie's other sister. <laughs> I have nothing, I'm, I don't work in Enfield. I actually work in Springfield as a teacher. Um, I come to Enfield for one month a year to teach in the Enfield Public School um, summer, summer Music Program. But I wanted to speak to the community. When we came here from Illinois, because my father was military, and we retired here, so we chose to come here after seeing most of the United States. Uh, one of the things that struck us was how, though spatially we're a huge town, really we're a small town at heart. And I wanted to say, say that's one of the things that I love about this town, is that it is such a small town at heart. And I left for a couple years and I came back because this is my hometown. And I've, it's the first place I can ever say that is a really a hometown for me. Um, so I, that's a beautiful thing about Enfield, that it wants, it wants people to call home. Um, one of the things that I would love to see is more family, community involvement things. Um, when we lived out in Illinois, we had this thing call at, in uh, Mascuda called the street dance. They would shut down Main Street, and they would bring out ev everybody and their brother was coming out to have a good time and to dance and to sing and to, to just chill. I would love to see more of that kind of thing from this community because I think we could do it and I think that would be a wonderful, we have Enfield Days, which is fantastic, but just a simple get together, coming out and, and being with each other and enjoying, I didn't know half of this stuff existed in this town, but having that to come out. And there's other things that exist that we haven't even talked about because they're not, not for profits. Um, 
like the SCA, which is, the, which is something that I'm involved in, it's a, a medieval recreation group. That if you need something, if you want something, somebody to come out to do a demo, we're all volunteer, we're all free. Come on out, call, give, give me a call. I know the people that can get to you and we can do, a really co we can do all kinds of stuff. Everything from, so, from crafts to cooking to uh, medieval fighting. You know, we have people who, we have our veterans groups, we have the American Legion in, the t in town that does a lot of stuff um, that's always there. They're not for profit, but they're always there and they're willing to help and all you gotta do is say, hey, give us a call. I'm the, part of the auxiliary, it's the same thing. We give scholarships to students in Enfield um, at the high school and we want to do that stuff. We're here to teach, we're here to help, and we, you've got lots of people that I didn't even know this stuff was here. So now that I know, I'd love to be part, and I'd love to help, because this is my town, that's why I'm here. Thank you, thank you. So we have just a few more minutes left, and we want to be sensitive to uh, you know, the time that you all have afforded us, uh, because again, we don't take this for granted, and uh, everything that is shared uh, is, is valuable, and, and, and that's why, you know, the staff is here, we're capturing it, uh, and, and really uh, synthesizing it to, to help inform and guide our work, uh, the priorities that we have uh, for uh, infield, for summers, uh, and for the entirety of the region. So, you know, that's why, uh, you know, we've been excited about what we've heard. We've been, um, uh, you know, and, and we've heard this, that these, the staff time to put this together, to, to come out, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, after a long, busy day, you think that you're on your way home, and you, then you look at the calendar and you realize, oh, we've got a listening stop, a listening tour stop. Uh, but invariably, uh, even though we might be, you know, tired driving here, uh, I walk away, uh, and, and the staff, uh, you know, not just I, the staff, we, we walk away energized, uh, reaffirmed uh, about the, the work that we're doing uh, because of the partnerships that we have, because of the donors uh, that we have, and because of the communities that we serve. So, uh, you know, if there are any final comments or observations, uh, oh, yes. Uh, hi, I'm Steph McGillivary. Uh, full disclosure, I work for the Hartford Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been a resident of Enfield for the last 19 years. You'll be shocked, you'll be shocked to know. Um, and I just wanted to say what I like about Enfield um, first of all, I'm really excited that the foundation's here because I love the foundation and I love Enfield, so you're mixing two things I love together. Um, what I love about Enfield, to kind of echo what Aaron said, is, is I love the small town feel with the big city amenities. Um, I love that we do come together as a community. We have our big Enfield Festival, uh, the fireworks uh, every 4th of July with some great bands. And we have um, my favorite event of the year, which is a torchlight parade, which is the big Christmas parade we have with all the fire trucks from around, ta uh, from around the surrounding towns dressed up uh, for Christmas. I love that. There's a big carol sing. Um, feels like Whoville. Um, <laughs> I also, when I, and I'm also involved in the community. I am a member of the Valley Repertory Company. I've been a member for almost 10 years. Uh, we used to be at High Street, and now we're here at Asnuntuck. And we, uh, Valley Rep started at Asnuntuck, and uh, after a few years of being on High Street, Valley Rep moved over back to its home because, um, well, it's free, <laughs> and <laughs> we're a nonprofit. Um, and all of our ticket sales go towards the scholarship, uh, so we're doing something good for the community. Uh, we're giving arts back to the college community, and we're also contributing uh, to the scholarship of students who desperately need it. So whenever I'm on stage, which is often, I feel really good um, about what I do. So I just want to thank the community members for coming out and talking to us today, and thank the Hartford Foundation for employing me and giving me money so I can live <laughs> in Enfield. Uh, so thank you. Stephanie, you are always on stage. <laughs> it, it, you know, just just let's just, just be very clear about that. Uh, so again, thank you, thank you. It's and as was affirmed by your mother. Yeah. Right? I, I heard yes. Yeah. So it's not just me. That's Steph. Oh, thank that's you. Steph. Okay, uh, but thank you all for uh, again sharing your time and and and, and your 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 passion and your uh, voices with us 
Um, and as I indicated, this isn't a one and done. You know, we're not checking a box and say, oh, we got infill in summers and we, we go on and you never hear from us again. We've been around for 93 years. We're going to be around for, you know, our, our, our obligation is to be here in perpetuity. To, you know, well, we won't be here in perpetuity, but the foundation uh, and, and the resources uh, to be here to serve the community. And there are, you know, a number of things that we're working toward and, and, and you know, the ideas of how do we anchor ourselves in this community uh, in a way that helps to provide resources to address, uh, you know, uh, there is going to be things that we address as a foundation uh, in the communities in the region. And then we want to figure out where are uh, perhaps tools that we can leave and anchor in this community that you all, uh, as residents of Summers and Enfield, uh, can have a more direct, uh, you know, involvement in addressing some of those things. So uh, our board is excited and supportive and, and by all means, Thank you, and please, uh, if you are able to join us on November 15th and you'll get an additional notification, you will hear, see, and feel your input, uh, your participation in our strategic plan and, and, and some of the things that we uh, you know, hope to uh, share with you. So uh, thank you for your time. There are still more uh, uh, refreshments to, to be had, and we look forward to an ongoing conversation with you all. Thank you to the staff. Thank you to everyone for joining us. Appreciate it.